present his lecture called, uh, entitled Atlas of the Mind, Neurodegeneracy and Pluralistic Ontology. So in two weeks from now, December 3rd at 10 a.m. is the next meeting of the Cognitive Ontology Seminar. Tomorrow on Friday at noon, my colleague from CMU, Simon Dedeo, will be giving a talk on explosive truth of mathematical truth at the center. And on the next week, on next week on Tuesday, I will be giving a talk uh, at noon again um, uh, for the lunchtime talk. Our perverse incentive responsible for the replication crisis. And uh, if you're interested in any of these events, please. Uh, go to uh, uh, the center's website and look at the calendar and you can find register, register, registration links for this, this Zoom events. Uh, we're using Zoom webinar. If you have a question for one for the speakers, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and just write your name. And then I will promote you to the status of panelists and you will be able to ask your question directly. Adina, go ahead. Great. Uh, so thank you for coming again to the Cognitive Ontology Seminar Series. And our first speaker today is going to be Marco Viola. He's a postdoc at the University of Torino or Turin in the Department of Philosophy and Educational Sciences. Uh, he works in epistemology, philosophy of mind, philosophy of cognitive science, and he's written extensively about the emotions. He has an edited book called Neural Mechanisms, New Challenges in the Philosophy of Neuroscience that uh, he's edited with Fabrizio Calzavarini uh, that is coming out soon. And he is uh, going to be giving his talk that is entitled A Neural-Based Assessment of Basic Emotion Theory, Accept, Reject, or Revise and Resubmit. Very clever. That's talk. <laughs> and welcome uh, Marco to uh, the seminar. Unmute you, Marco. We can't hear you. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. I was thanking Agina, Adina and Edward and Alex McGee, of course, for the technical help. And um, can you see my screen? Yes. So good. Now, uh, I must also thank Vincenzo Kruppi, who sponsored me, and particularly my air ticket to Pittsburgh, although that was not the most fortunate figure of the history, but still, <laughs> thank you anyway. Now, this topic, the neural based assessment of basic emotion, kind of troubled me for uh, uh, years. It's been the topic of my PhD dissertation, and still, I never managed to put up a paper uh, about this topic. And my excuse is that, to quote uh, one of the most influent philosophers of the last century, well, you know, this is a very complicated case. You know, a lot of ins, a lot of hows, a lot of what you, what have you, and who, lots of strengths to keep in my head, man. But now, I, thanks to this uh, occasion, I've tried to put up a uh, relatively simplified story to get exactly to the point I want to make, but I'll be uh, any suggestion on how to reframe the narrative uh, uh, will be uh, very welcome. So let's, let me try to uh, ask and answer this question that is, does neural evidence speak for or against basic emotions? The outline of this talk to get to the answer or rather to the answers Will be first. I will wear the. Uh, I will act as a histor historian of science, and I will provide a sketchy rational reconstruction of the debate in basic emotions. And then I will need, since this leads to uh, controversy, I will need to reframe our initial question. And then, with the conceptual tools I will develop, hopefully, in the reframing phase, I should be able to adjudicate some answer to this question. But first, let me begin with the rational reconstruction. Now, as you might know, um, Paul Ekman's basic emotion theory was uh, straightforwardly inspired inside out. You know, the five characters we see in inside out are five out of the six emotions that in one of the most famous formulation of his theory were considered the, the pillars of the ontology of emotion. They are from the left to the right, anger, fear, joy, or happiness, and disgust, and then sadness. And I 
there is an emotion that did not make her way to the screen. And that surprise, which I represent with that Jack in the box in the top left corner. Now, basic emotion is an umbrella term. Basic emotion theory are, are, are many kinds, it's okay. And many theories has been called basic emotion theory. And uh, uh, Paul Ekman's theory is just the most famous. So I will start from there or more specifically since his, his thought changed across the decades, I will refer specifically to this uh, paper of 1992, where he presents his uh, theory into uh, a framework loosely inspired by some uh, old school uh, uh, evolutionary psychology. Hmm? The first of uh, is uh, the evidence uh, on which he builds the ontology of emotion is that he has evidence of uh, cross-cultural or pan-cultural or universal facial expressions, it's okay, which is arguably inherited from philogenesis rather than uh, uh, learned. And that's why also blind people display similar facial expressions, okay? And they are shared among um, uh, arguably all populations on the earth. And that's why also monkeys expression resemble some human expression, or at least in this case, resemble Paul Ekman's own expressions. Now, there's lots of interesting stuff here going on, but I will just tell to keep the story short that many people uh, had many trouble on uh, behavioral grounds with this theory, okay? For instance, if we are true to a naive view of Ekman's theory, the expression of uh, this woman should be anger, okay? That should be an, anger, an angry case if uh, Ekman's theory is uh, to be applied straightforwardly. But if we take into account the context, we see that she's just Serena Williams being hyper excited about winning some tennis tournament or something like that. And this is just one of the arguments that were uh, uh, on which the opponents, the many opponents of basic emotion theory leveraged to uh, cast doubts onto Ekman's theory and onto the ontology of emotion that it comes with. Now, we're not here to discuss behavioral data, though this is a cycle of seminars about uh, uh, neuroscience and psychology, and especially how neuroscientific data inform the cognitive ontology. So we want to focus on uh, neuroscience, and that's also what it has been invoked by Ekman himself. He claimed back in 1992 that there must be unique physiological patterns for each emotion. But my favorite quote is another one. It's the quote from Andreas Carantino, who claims that the holy grail of, of affective neuroscience it is a search for separate and dedicated neural circuits specific for each discrete emotions. Why do I like this, this uh, quote? You'll see in a moment. First, let me just, uh, it's clear that I cannot go through all single uh, articles, especially in this talk, because there were dozens. So I've just uh, uh, surveyed seven meta-analysis uh, of uh, the neural basis of emotion that uh, cover the first, say, 15 years of uh, hemodynamic, especially of uh, bold fMRI uh, studies, okay, from 1990 to 2015. And they all converge in saying that, no, there is nothing like a straightforward amygdala fear correspondence, okay, each emotion uh, involves multiple regions and each uh, region uh, uh, is activated. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm, that's the show for selectively activated, comparatively more, et cetera, et cetera. But in short, each region is activated by multiple emo emotion categories. So what we have is, uh, is uh, unsurprisingly, many too many mappings. Now, we can also observe that many too many should not be confused with any to any, okay? Brain regions are not equipotential. And we can find that uh, across different studies and paradigms and subjects, 
there are some relatively stable networks, or let's call them prudently patterns of regions. I mean, whenever you have, say, anger, you have three or four regions that reliably show up and so on and so forth. Some of, the, of them will be shared with other emotion categories, but still we can tell was the emotion uh, uh, activated by some task based on, the, on this distributed neural base. Now take these two meta-analysis by different scholars, first Vito and Aman, and then Weger and colleagues, including Lisa Barrett, who is possibly the fiercest of, of the opponents of basic emotion theory. With regard to our Oli Grail, they are, uh, they are agreeing about the shape of the findings. That is, we have pattern of brain activation. And yes, if you turn to their conclusion, you see that the Ole Grail soon turns out to be a Rubin goblet, that is a bistable figure, because the same pattern of findings, that is, that we have pattern, but not specific regions for discrete emotions. Uh, well, this pattern of findings is uh, considered by Vital Aman as a strong proof in favor of basic emotion theory. Whereas Weger and colleague do not think that it does not support, it fails to provide support for basic emotion theory. So whenever there is some uh, kind of underdetermination and the same da data provide different and in this case opposite conclusion, there is some philosophical job to be done. <laughs> so here comes the reframing phase. In order to uh, solve this controversy, we need to make the assumption explicit. Now, in a relatively recent paper, my friend and colleague Juan Loaiza tried to put some order in this messy debate. And he claimed that in order to interpret neural evidence as favorable or against basic emotion theory or whatever emotion theory we want to, to defend or to assess, we need a set of criteria and to, to, to make sense of these criteria explicitly point toward the debate of cognitive ontology and more specifically to three ways of approaching the debate which are described by Mike Anderson's field compass paper. So far so good. So that's where we are also going. As many knows, uh, Mike provides a nice uh, reconstruction on this uh, increasingly fashionable uh, uh, trick that psychologists use that is if there's some uh, doubt about the psychological reality of some category, we check brain data and see if these categories are real. But there are of course many ways to do so. And I try to put them in three, into three approaches loosely inspired by, Mike, by Mike's uh, description. First, we have the conservatives. Conservatives have their own mental category that they want to test based on fault or more, more often on cognitive psychology. Hmm? And they use the, the brain just as a litmus test. Like, are there neural bases for these categories? Are they consistent? If they are not, it's not a job for neuroscientists to reframe the category. They come back to psychologists and they come with a new set of categories. It's okay. So it's at best a confirmatory role. Whereas it's a continuum, not a categorical distinction, but say that the moderates are those who are in the middle of this uh, uh, brain as no role, brain as all the role uh, continuum. And, and moderates think that neural evidence can refurnish research programs. That is, they are open to both top down and bottom up suggestions for reframing cognitive ontology. And then the, the extreme toward the bottom up, uh, uh, we have the radicals. According to the radicals, neural evidence in itself and alone should be able to provide us with new mental categories. And we can take the old categories from cognitive and full psychology and put them in the trash bin in a sense, well, in all sense. Now, we can make a game. We can take our copy of Alpha Phrenology and turn, I'm quoting the back cover of this book this time, 
because if you see, uh, not only Mike is among uh, the advocates of the radical approach to cognitive ontology, there is also Lisa Feldman Barrett, who, as I mentioned before, is possibly the greater thorns in the back of the basic emotion theorists. She is a fierce radical and she wants a profound radical reform of emotion ontology. Now, these three approaches uh, to, toward cognitive ontology reform can be mapped onto three ways to look at the basic emotion theory and to interpret Ekman's claims in that paper of 1992. According to a first a strong reading, basic emotion theory is a specific uh, scientific theory with very strict claims. And on the ontological point of view, these claims are there are about six emotions. And these are all you need if you want a complete taxonomy of all possible affective states. That's okay. And they have these nine characteristics. Lisa Barrett is more ambitious, though she doesn't interpret basic emotion theory just as a specific theory with a specific uh, empirical prediction. She also wants to challenge the very principles inspiring it. It is the modularism of a Fodorian kind of modularism, not massive modularism, and faculty psychology. And she is not only a good scientist, she's also a wonderful philosopher, I think, because she is very explicit in quoting Kuhn. She says more or less, look, I know that uh, old paradigms are not just jettisoned because anomalies falsify them. We need more than a single falsification. Anomalies are just forgotten. That's how Kuhn explains that paradigm works until I, you don't have a new paradigm. If you have a new paradigm, you can jump on the new paradigm and forget the old ones with all its flaws. And of course, she proposes all the people in the field to jump on her paradigm, which is the paradigm of the theory of constructed emotions, okay? So in a way, her challenge to basic emotion is more radical than just claiming that there are not the six categories. Although there is another view on the history of science that is less revolutionary and more uh, reformist, if you, if you like, that is Imre Lakatos' view of uh, uh, the, prog the progress of science being made with research programs, okay? As you know, uh, a Lakatosian research program is made by a hardcore, because no scientific hypothesis it can be directly falsified or verified by data, okay? they need some auxiliary exemption. But if you really want to defend some specific hypothesis, this is the engine of your research program, you can shield it from refute from what will seem prima facie as an anomaly, as a refutation, call it however you wish, by putting the blame on the auxiliary hypothesis, on the protective belt, right? Also, on uh, Lakatosh account, there is not a parasitic new paradigm that kills the old paradigm and take all the ground, okay? And monopolistically uh, take, uh, I mean, all, all the ground of the, 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 that field of science. No, there are several research programs and they are all into this perennial competition to fit with data and make new predictions. Well, this is the kind of, uh, this is the account of science that I think more uh, reliable and if we frame the emotion, basic emotion theory Ekman's paper uh, in, as a paper describing as a research program, we see a core, which is there are discrete affective modules and we can interpret modules here in a quite conservative Fodorian sense, okay? And the nine characteristics that he lists as uh, exegetical evidence I'm suggesting seems to support are but diagnostic characteristics, okay? And the six emotions just turn out to be uh, the, the, the best candidates in this historical moment. But look, they do not inhabit the art core. They are part of the auxiliary assumption, it's okay? So we can jettison on them if that's for the sake of saving the art core. 
Now, this should allow me to separate two distinct claims, okay, that are hierarchically ordinated. On the one hand, we have the weaker claim on the top, that is basic emotion is a viable research program, okay? So there are discrete and separate affective modules. This is more or less the idea behind uh, Jack Punk's uh, affective uh, neuroscience. This is also the idea that is guiding Ralph Adolf and David Anderson's uh, uh, book and research uh, more recently. And it's, it's been defended on philosophical grounds by this guy is Andreas Carantino. But within this view, we can be more committed to the specific ontology and more specifically to the specific six mental categories. That basic, uh, that basic emotion theory of uh, uh, in that Ekman's paper claim being the pillar and all and only what we need to characterize affective lives. Now, the moderates are more or less uh, uh, defending the uh, research program reading of basic emotion theory, whereas the conservatives might want to defend the specific six categories. It's okay. Whereas, of course, if you're a radical, you just want to see the word burn, or at least the old paradigm burn, and just uh, you just want to demonstrate with neural data that basic emotions are no more viable paradigm. It's okay. So now this distinction between free approaches, which met on free readings of basic emotion theory are all the tools I need, hopefully, to move to the next and final stage, that is adjudicating and trying to give some answer to this question you see up there. Now, a brief recap. We know from uh, data until more or less uh, five years ago that from univariate uh, studies, emotion never map onto a single region. That's the same as any mental category, of course, but they map onto patterns that are more or less made up by the same regions across different studies and different subjects. It's okay. Uh, this evidence has been uh, regarded as positive or negative evidence for the for basic emotions because the evidence per se is a Rubin goblet, a disabled figure like the duck rabbit, you know, depends on how you're looking at it. So now that's the game I want to play in the last 10 minutes of my presentation. Suppose that we have uh, those three positions, the conservatives willing to defend basic emotions, very commitments on the six emotion categories, the moderates that are content to defend the general approach of the research program and the radicals that push uh, it further and they test the paradigm in a rather resist or die fashion. Now I'm wondering what kind of data will they, uh, will they need to accept that either bet T or bet RP or even bet P will, uh, will be verified. Of course, they will all agree that if only we found that fear lives into the amygdala and insula has, uh, is the house of disgust and so on, they'll be fine for them. We have the region for each emotion and that's it. But this is not the case for emotion, nor for any other mental states. Although there might be some caveats, we might talk about it in the q and if you wish. What we rather have is patterns, okay? And these patterns, these networks, I'll say it sometimes, are a sufficient evidence for both conservatives and moderates, okay? There are plenty of papers claiming this. Whereas the radicals say, what, patterns? No, they won't do. Now, if you're surprised, if, if you disagree that patterns do not constitute a sufficiently solid neural base to ground the psychological reality of these emotions, you might be not alone. In one of these meta-analyses, uh, uh, Lisa Barrett's team, linguists and colleagues, uh, uh, that, that was published on BBS as a target article, okay? And many commentators uh, like, you know, Andres Carantino, but also Luis Pessoa, uh, they claimed, look, but there are neural bases of emotions. It's just that they are patterns rather than single regions. That's normal. That's 
everywhere in neuroscience, you've got patterns rather than regions. And they claim, and the response of the construction is, is pretty interesting and it's worth discussing for a minute. That is, look, guys, we realize that mental categories are grounded not on single regions, but rather on, on, on patterns. But it's not like any network will do. It's okay. These are just contingent networks. They are they are they are constructed on the fly. I don't know if there's my connected, but it, they are what Mike Anderson in his book calls talons. Okay, Trans transiently assembled, etc. Okay, if we want to ground basic uh, emotion or whatever mental category, we need uh, a kind of network that has some some more reality. Okay, that is more intrinsic to the brain. Um, functioning. And what do they mean? What is an intrinsic network? The kind of intrinsic network they look for. And that, if it were seen to, to support, to, to underlie a basic emotion, will grant this basic emotion the right to stay, to be a citizen in our cognitive ontology. Well, they mean the resting state networks. So they will accept to, to provide a new uh, psychological reality to basic emotion if only their sparse neural basis were such that the co-activated regions that cluster together into resting state networks were the, the same regions that cluster together during the instances of specific emotion. And they address this question in this uh, very odd study. Um, and they took the activation peaks for each emotion from Vital and Aman's meta-analysis that I recall supports basic emotion. And they take them and, and wonder, well, where this region, where did, what are the regions, these emotion-specific region cluster with? Who are their functional companion in resting state? And of course, they find that their functional companion carve the brain in ways that are different from what we will, uh, uh, from how it carves up when there is some task eliciting an emotion. Okay, so they conclude that we don't have intrinsic networks for each basic emotion. We have just functional network, but they don't count. Now, it's, it's, I have some troubles with that. That might be interesting to talk, uh, an interesting topic for the Q&A. Why should these intrinsic networks stand at the core of the radical reform of cognitive ontology? I mean, I see thousands of problems. Among them, the idea the resting state networks provide the key for the ultimate workings of cognitive function uh, as to meet these, these problems. First, the very paper they cite is much more prudent than they, they would like because Buckner and colleagues claim something like, look, don't refine resting state networks. They might, that might be just one task among other with no special status, okay? But also we know the resting state networks do not come without a thousands of statistical choices as anything in neuroscience, you need the, to choose how to cluster them. Many regions belong to several resting state networks. So it's, it's hard to know where to reify that mirrors the uh, Edward and Joe's objection to bottom-up cognitive ontology. And again, Joe McCaffrey with David Danks uh, provided seri serious reasons to, to think that resting state networks can be, uh, can cluster the cognitively spurious activity or perhaps even worse, if you're familiar with Philippa Weiss' work, ah, it was there in Pittsburgh, and he probably told you about his idea, which I find compelling. The brain, before being a cognitive organ, is a biological organ. So much of his new, its neurovascular activity might be due not to some to task related to cognition in a straightforward way. Much of this neurovascular activity can be due to to homeostasis, to maintenance of, to repairing the brain or something along this line. And then even if we grant that resting state is a key for unraveling the functioning of the brain, 
Why should we only care about the intrinsic building block? Why should we care about composite? Okay, uh, because we also need molecules in a cognitive ontology, not only atoms. So in any way, let me say that for right now, the radical position in general needs to be uh, reworked a bit. It might be very promising, but I want to know more about how to, to put up uh, workable operational definition from psychological point of view. Now, let me ask, do the, we have review evidence uh, from univariate uh, analysis, but do MVPA uh, support resting state networks, uh, uh, support uh, networks for basic emotion? Well, let me check. The, the most notable experiment that addresses this question is an experiment from Sari Maki and colleagues where they elicited the motion via two modalities, okay, with short clips and with self-evoked uh, uh, proce a self a procedure for self-evoking emotion based on memories, okay. They collect brain activation specific for each emotion from both modalities from several subjects and they use them to train a classifier. This classifier showed to be able to, to make a, a prediction above chance level of which kind of emotion was involved hmm, among the basics based on the neural patterns. So, and most interestingly, it showed to be able to, to predict, say, an anger elicit, an, 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 an instance of anger elicited by a clip, also using data with anger elicited by self-evoked emotion. And most notably, uh, it can be trained with the pink subject data and it can predict the blue subjects neural activation. So the authors claim that basic emotions have discrete and solid neural basis that are consistent across individuals. So game, set, match, well, just wait a moment. And that's the final point. They also, uh, concede, pushed by Barrett and, and other with, that made sound consideration that, well, the fact that we can find neural basis for these six emotions does not mean that this is the only nor the better way to look for the correlates of, of uh, emotions. And indeed, in a proof of concept, they showed that they can find a similar sparse neural basis of something like 20 emotion states. And look, you can we can see that surprise, for instance, which is a basic emotion, has a very high ac accuracy in, in this prediction, but love is the second best among the emotion and it was not one of the basic emotions. So if we are moderates, we shall be ready to admit that yes, there are neural markers for basic emotions, but also for non-basic emotions. And so the idea that there is a divide between basic and non-basic uh, is obsolete. So the only option if we want to keep all and only these six uh, uh, emotion is to be a conservative. You can be a conservative and say, okay, I don't care about the neural correlates of love. I don't care about love. Okay, I'm a conservative and, and we don't love. And we just want to defend the six basic emotion because we have psychological valid reasons to think that they are the building blocks of our effective lives. But the fact is that at some point, the debate on cognitive ontology, especially if you are conservatives, should go back to psychology. Because if you think that there's few work that can be done on neuroscientific ground, at least you, you have to provide strong behavioral evidence for your categories. And to make a long story short, Almost no, nobody today thinks that there are special behavioral ground for defending these six emotions. And even those who proudly pursue the research program of basic emotion say, look, Ekman was good, it gave us good principles, but now we're stopping his obsession with faces. We are looking for cues for behavioral markers of emotions in voice, in bodily expressions more in general, and we found more than 20 emotions. So nobody defends the six categories anymore. And overall, if you accept my assumptions, 
the field has you have to remove a lot of possible outcomes and the only outcome that i suggest until the radicals develop a, a more uh, complete framework is to be a moderate and to pursue the search for uh, a basic emotion and their neural markers, but being open to reform that list. So take on messages on a methodological ground. The ta first take on message is that brain based reforms of our cognitive ontology are no lie grail. They are per se a Rubin goblet, a be stable figure. And you can see either a goblet or two faces, depending on where you sit, where you stand on this continuum in psychology as a say, neuroscience as a say, with all the degrees of gray. But for the point of view of effective science, I've tried to show that no, it doesn't matter where you stand on this continuum, there are no good reason to keep these six categories as a special having a special status rather than others so we should be we should hurry in updating our database which too often encompass all and all of these emotion so that's more or less the list of references i've used today and thank you everybody for your attention thanks marco for this great lecture um so we have um, um 13 minutes for a question. Adina, do you want to go first? Unmute yourself. I muted, yes. Uh, so thank you, that was really interesting. Um, I guess what it raises uh, for me is the question of whether there are any distinguishable emotions at all in the sense that, uh, that categories make sense. So are there, uh, you know, ontologically real boundaries, or should we be thinking of mo of emotions more along the model of the RDOC criteria, where what you have are underlying neural mechanisms that can, you know, interact in many many different ways, and um, and we should be thinking more in that framework and rejecting the idea that you can draw distinct boundaries between emotions at all. Well, thank you. I, I love this question. Uh, you know, in the previous version of these slides, there were uh, many more. I included a direct comparisons between two models because I, like Lakatos, think that uh, the science uh, is never theory and data. How do they fit? But it's always relative, uh, a triangular relation between two or more theories and data. Which theory best accounts for for some properties of, of data we have. And I'd love to, to compare basic emotion theory to its main uh, rival, uh, to the rival account I just mentioned, that is Lisa Barrett and James Russell's, among the other, uh, constructed emotion theory, which say, look, we have a base, a, a core effect that is uh, in and changes in that core effect that is represented by these two axes, violence and arousal, are interpreted on the basis of concepts and these interpretations give rise to emotion. And now to make a long story short, this longer version of the talk will say that, look, discrete basic emotion system have some troubles finding a stable neural basis perhaps, but the neural basis of core effect are even worse. And also on psychological grounds, there are some ongoing controversies uh, that uh, I publish about uh, on the structure of core affect, because the idea that uh, you have a hedonic tone that is either positive or negative is being called in, in strong doubts by people, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Asaf Kron or Larsen, because that model uh, implies that you cannot have ambivalent emotion. You cannot be happy and sad at once. That's, that's forbidden by, a priori by the model, but this, there are some data, both neural and, uh, and behavioral data, that seem to suggest that this is possible. So I'd love to, to, to include the comparison with the model you're pointing at, if, I'm, if I've understood what you had in mind, but there was no time here. And, but, and, and, and when I will do it, I will show that that's a mess, even more a mess. So can I follow up? It, it does. Are you saying yeah, that? Yeah, you can, yeah. Go ahead. Are you saying that uh, there is good evidence 
against a continuous spectrum model? No, I'm or just you saying that you're that there's evidence against this particular version of a model. Yeah, that's that's it. Second. Okay. Thanks, Adina. Joe. Did this work out? Hi, Marco. Uh, sorry that uh, we didn't get the chance to meet in Pittsburgh after lots of good conversations. Uh, I wish I was, you know, having a beer with uh, you and Adina and Uliana and everybody right now. Uh, well, maybe not at 940 or whatever, but you get the idea. Uh, so I have a question about the... You're muted. I wanted to get your perspective. I wanted to try something out in terms of the uh, study by um, on uh, resting state. So the uh, Tor Tulago uh, and all study uh, that talked about intrinsic uh, connectivity networks. Um, so one worry, yeah. Uh, so one worry that I have about that study is uh, that it seems you could almost provide a, a reductio ad absurdum of the inferences that they make from the evidence in that paper, right? So they talk about how you know regions involved in emotions are actually part of these intrinsic connectivity networks that allegedly have some more basic function like salience detection or attention orientation or you know memory and autobiography in the case of some functions of the default mode network which has a ton of functions and the reductio says something like for that to be a good inference does it have to be true that intrinsic connectivity networks as revealed by resting state fMRI have to correspond in some neat way to the basic emotions, or sorry, to the basic ingredients of cognition. So that if you did like a dimension reduction on all the cognitive tasks we do, they are all some combination and recombination of those networks, right? And so I don't know, I just wonder, is that, do you think that that would be a fair, you know, reductio? Because I think I could do that with other cognitive tasks, right? I could say, well, yeah, some people think the superior temporal sulcus is specialized for, biological motion or goal detection or social situations, but actually, you know, it more strongly corresponds to this, you know, based some other, you know, intrinsic connectivity network. So I don't know, I just find, I find that idea, I find that inference suspect on the grounds that it would seem then that, you know, we've got this technique resting state fMRI, it happens to identify 18 or whatever, uh, you know, fun intrinsic connectivity networks. And you just sort of say that those are, you know, the basic dimensions of cognition or something like that. So I don't know, just curious what you think about that argument. Yeah, well, I will provide a short answer because the long answer would really need that be you mentioned. I find, I find this study crazy and that's probably because of me, I'm missing something, but they have the strong feeling that they got kind of drunk about the, the potential of these intrinsic networks. I mean, a priori, you can guess that if, if, if there is something happening in the mind, there should be for necessarily some change in, in the intrinsic, in the connectivity you see when nothing is happening, provided that rest means nothing. And you have provided good reasons to that. So, so this, this, this study seems trivial. I mean, you can do that from the armchair, possibly. You can demonstrate the same output. But this is possibly me missing something. We've got to talk about this because I can't make real sense about this. Is it equally puzzling to you? Yeah, the, yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> puzzling uh, because it seems to, it would be a really radical conclusion if the, the mind itself had 18 uh, dimensions of variation and each one corresponds to the networks that you find active at rest. And that seems to be uh, a kind of implicit assumption that they make in arguing that this is true in the domain of you know, emotions. So I don't know. I just find it, I find it puzzling that it seems like they're saying something that's incredibly radical about, you know, structure function mapping that gives intrinsic connectivity networks this enormous weight as the, uh, you know, sort of the most fundamental building blocks of cognition almost, if you, if you read the paper a certain way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In fact, in the recent papers, Barrett is a bit more defensive about it. She made some half steps steps back because she's also working. So she's probably still trying to make sense out of it. But we'll see. We'll ask her maybe. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Joe. I think I'll, I'll take a one minute to ask a quick question and then we we'll transition to the next lecture. So, I mean, I, I have a slightly different take on, on some of these debates, which is inspired by, in fact, my acquaintance with 
the psychology of emotions. Um, and in many ways, I don't view Barrett as being a very original thinker about emotion. She's just, you know, a warmed over constructivist and she's uh, rehashing the James Avril theory of the 1980s uh, in a modern context. So, you know, she, she's sprinkling a bit of neuroscience on top of it, but the psychology of emotions that she has a very old fashioned uh, psychology of emotion. And I think what's going on there is that people aren't really talking about the same thing. They're starting with uh, folk terminology of emotion, folk concepts, you know, in English, anger or, or peur en français, and so on and so forth. And then they're taking that to map onto genuine psychological constructs without um, uh, taking for granted that, in fact, the word uh, um, there is no one-to-one -one relation between English words or French words or Italian words, for that matter, or Bengali words, and, and, the, right and the right psychological constructs, right? So what we mean by fear could be mapped onto something quite different depending on well, how broad we want to understand what fear really is. So there's a very nice paper by Stitch and Malone um, now about 15 years ago that discusses the debate between constructivists and uh, evolutionary thinkers about emotion. So it just makes this very same point. People use the same word, anger, fear, and so on and so forth, but they're really not talking about the same psychological state. And then you end up with these myths about the neuroscience, which is partly driven by a lack of clarity about the psychology. So I, I mean, my concern here is that many of these people just are not very clear about the psychology itself. Um, so I don't know why I wanted to know what you think about that concern, yeah. which is pretty different from the one you've been focusing on. Well, uh, uh, only a short answer because that will require, you know, it's a great Lebowski situation again. But many people blame Ekman for positing uh, folk concepts and putting them into the arena of psychology and then somebody else bring them into neuroscience. Now, to be honest, he was not as wise as, as Panksepp who flagged the non-folkness of his concepts by using capital letters, okay? Panksepp affect system are always fear capital. It's not shouting, it's just making clear uh, that is, it doesn't want to mean a one-to-one -one mapping from his psychological category and to a folk category. Neither Ekman did. He provides some rough, perhaps, uh, grounds for establishing that they are psychological constructs, but his choice not to flag that is unfortunate because he is vulnerable to this objection, which is a misposed objection, I think, but it's partly Ekman's fault. I mean, it, it was not really interested in theory, so is doing the chapter notes and, and it just doesn't care about his critics. But that, that might be uh, a bit ingenuous to blame Ekman for that. Although that's a mess, that's, that's a very complicated mess. Andreas Carantino have written great things about this mess. Yeah. I mean, I know I, I, I don't have time to follow up. I don't want to blame Ekman, but uh, we'll talk more about that at, uh, hopefully uh, very, very, very soon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, Marco. And uh, you yeah, the floor is yours. And I now with this introduction. Sorry. Edward, is, do you, is it time? Yeah. For me? Please yeah. go ahead. OK. Uh, so our next speaker is Yoed Kennett. He's the senior lecturer, which is, I guess, an Israeli assistant professor at the Faculty of Industrial Engineering and Management at the Technion in Israel. Uh, he studies how semantic memory structure enables and constrains high-level cognitive process processes in typical and in clinical populations. And to do this, he uses complement computational methods to represent semantic memory structure as well as empirical neurocognitive methods to directly examine these computational findings. Uh, his talk today is uh, entitled Developing a Neurally Informed Ontology of Creativity Measurement. So thank you for joining us, Yoed. Thank you very much. Introduction, yes. Okay, great. So can you see my screen? We can. Yes. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk today and for attending, uh, this is a project um, which is the first step down a path that relates to uh, ontologies, cognitive ontologies. So we're, I'm very excited on behalf of me and my co-authors. Uh, oops. 
that um, this is called this project is a collaboration between my lab, the lab of David Kramer from Dartmouth College, and the lab of Adam Green from Georgetown University, and where we try to move towards the first step towards an ontology of creativity measurement, which I will talk about uh, now. So creativity is something that we, uh, most of us are fascinated about, if not all of us are fascinated about. We all strive to be creative. We all want to be creative, generating creative ideas, be novel, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's great. But the question is, what is creativity? And how do we measure it? In fact, creativity as a scientific field, and specifically from the fields of cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience, was very much on hold and stagnated till about the end of the 1990s, uh, where a very strong cognitive and cognitive neuroscience push have really facilitated forward the research on, on creativity. And there are two big reasons for why creativity wasn't really studied for many, many years. The first big problem is that actually creativity is many different things. Creativity is related to issues, to topics of, from play and imagination all the way to uh, insight and problem solving, art, um, different, different domains, um, et cetera. So in fact, when you bring together creativity researchers under one roof, and I was in one such event, and they all talk about what creativity is, there is no agreement because actually people who study creativity study from very different uh, perspectives. So that's one big problem. We don't really know what creativity is. The second big problem that has really held back the research on creativity is the problem of measurement or the task that we use to measure creativity in the lab. All, most of these measures were actually developed in the first half of the 20th century and are mostly based on subjective rating of different creativity dimensions. Um, again, from the, in the last two decades, there's been a really big push in called cognitive and cognitive neuroscience uh, research on creativity that really needs very uh, valid operationalized tasks. And there's a growing descent and discomfort in the tool, the tool that we have been using traditionally to measure creativity. This is an example of maybe the most widely used task to study creativity in the lab. It's called an alternative uses task. And it is used to measure the construct of divergent thinking, which is one of the co core uh, components of um, creative thinking, right? The task is very simple. You can see an object like this box. And all they have to do is to say, what are all the possible alternative uses as to this box? Unique uses as novel uses as there's different variants to this task, but they're all very much the same, right? So when people do this task, uh, just as a short example, a demonstration, most times the first response is you could put things in it, which is a great response, but it's not very creative. If we ask participants to continue on and generate more responses, they may say you can hide in it and then maybe even um, you, can use, uh, you can use it as a concept. So consistently over many studies, what is found is that when people are engaged in this task, the response become more and more creative. Um, and this is the task that is most widely used in behavioral, cognitive, and also in neural uh, research. But we don't really know a lot about what this task is measuring, how it relates to brain activity, and again, what other components of creativity there are. So a few years ago, uh, the Society for the Neuroscience of Creativity was established, and one of its main aims uh, as a society is to advance our understanding of what creativity is and create some cohesion across, again, the various flavors of, of creativity researchers uh, on the board that mostly study this from cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience um, perspective. And the talk today is, uh, is, the, is, I'm going to describe a project that is just one first step of that aim that we have been, we have been working on. So as I just to sum all of this confusion up, and it's a huge confusion, uh, creativity, two big problems. One is what is it? And when we say, what is it? We can ask what are its key constructs? Uh, divergent thinking again is one of them, but there are other reasoning, convergent thinking, we'll talk about that later. How do these constructs, how can we understand or define them? How can we operationalize them? And also importantly, how do they relate to each other in allowing this complex multidimensional construct to take place. 
The second big problem that strongly relates to this is how do we measure it? And how can we match constructs to specific tasks that can uniquely uh, and validly measure these constructs? And, and this is critical for ability to, again, to understand and measure these constructs. So from the one hand, we still really don't know what this is all about. And from the other hand, we don't really know how to measure it. And the aim here today was to, uh, in this project, was to demonstrate through an initial, very minimal proof of concept, how we can uh, leverage meta-analytic data-driven approaches to use neuroscience or neuroimaging data to support the, uh, an ontological mapping between creative relevant constructs and tasks that measure these constructs. Specifically, we do this based on the assumption that similarity or dissimilarity at the neural level can inform us to the extent to which these constructs relate to each other. And that's as we may can say that we are moderates maybe based on the previous talk. Um, so our goals in this study was one, to compare a neural construct space with an expert behavioral based space. And I'll get into that uh, in the next couple of slides. And then to, mat, to ask how task specific, uh, how specific tasks that measure these uh, constructs uh, relate to uh, the constructs at the neural level. So how do we do all of this? First off, I'll just talk a little bit about the participants in our study. We specifically set out to collect data from expert creativity researchers. So we went out and we approached uh, the, the community of two different creativity communities. The first is from the Society of the Neuroscience of Creativity, which I talked about. And the second is from the uh, American Psychological Association, Division 10, which is the Society for the Psychology of Aesthetics, Creativity, and the Arts. And across, and we approached as many of uh, people in, in these two communities and asked them to fill a short survey uh, with three different tasks. And today I'll only talk about one of these tasks. Overall, we collected data from 65 participants. You can see here their demographic information. They're averaging across of 10 years of expertise in creativity. So fairly a good amount of knowledge in what creativity should be about. The next step was, so what did we do with these participants? Was we um, had them look at a set of creativity related terms. These terms we decided on 10 specific terms that are uh, again prototypical strongly relevant constructs or terms that relate to creativity divergent thinking is here we talked a little bit about that but others we also have the term creativity because we're interested in general structure uh, flexibility generation imagery inside novelty reasoning cognitive control and convergent thinking so all of these are very strongly relevant constructs that have been studied under the line of, of uh, creativity and then participants uh, were asked to judge, they were presented with all possible pairs of the uh, response of, of these constructs or terms. And all they had to do is, is judge, again, based on the seven types of overlapping Venn circles, how much these two terms uh, overlap with each other. And for this example, convergence making flexibility, and they did this for all possible pairs. This allows us to represent a similarity based space based on these expert ratings of how much these 10 terms uh, overlap with each other, again, based on these ratings. This will be our behavioral space or, or uh, structure that we're gonna compare with neural data that relates to these terms. To get these neural data, we went to and used Neurosynth, which is an open access um, meta analytical platform that has that uh, uh, applies text mining uh, and techniques over about 15,000 fMRI studies and allows to extract for specific terms that you input into it meta analytic maps that represent the brain activations across these domains that uh, the these terms right so we extracted the these meta-analytic neural maps from neuroscience for each of, of the terms. We spent a lot of time uh, going through and collecting the specific studies that are in this database. So there are over 15,000 database studies, excuse me. But 
Creativity, as I said before, is only is a small field and there's only a very few studies. And we wanna make sure that the papers that we're using to extract from these meta-analytical neural maps were extremely relevant to, more directly relevant to creativity. Also, we wanted to make sure that we have enough of these papers to build a valid neural meta-analytical map for each of the constructs. So we set a threshold of more than 20 papers for each of the constructs. And that led for us uh, to discard, unfortunately discard convergent thinking. So we remained with the list of nine terms uh, out of the 10 that we saw before. So for each of the nine terms, we extract a meta-analytical neural map. Um, and then we turn these maps, which you see here. And again, this is divergent thinking. Um, we turn those into vector arrays and use that to compute the similarity. Oops, sorry. This is the example I'm just going to show you. This is the thing. Uh, these are other terms, creativity and novelty, I'm sorry. And then we used, uh, again, the spear and correlation to compute the overall similarity between these analytical maps of these nine by nine terms, okay? So the more the neural overall neural, whole brain neural activity of a term was similar to another term, that led to a higher spearman correlation. So this allows us to extract a term-based neural similarity structure or space. And as, if you recall, we have this also based on the expert raters. So we have two spaces and we're gonna compare them through different uh, directions. Great, okay. So the first thing that we looked at, we used multidimensional scaling approaches to just plot out the space, the organization of the expert-based model versus the, and the neural model. Uh, based on, again, the similarities, either from the behavioral or from the neural data, and compare them. What we see here is what we found is some similarities, but also some differences um, that is already starting to inform, again, the differences of how much then the relation between the similarity of neural activations and, and behavioral ratings judgments of, of these terms. So, for example, what you see here, inside is up here, and we have inside here as well. Um, we have reasoning and cognitive control. They're also here too. So there's, there's some similarities, but there's also actually a lot of the differences. Here we have this large cluster of, 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 of constructs. Uh, again, this is biased by the small number of terms and also by the sample, uh, but it is starting to, again, to allow us to start to infer the potential similarities and differences um, of the neural and the behavioral levels of these constructs. So that was just once the first third step that we did. Next, we wanted to start comparing these models one to another. And we did, we did these comparisons across different directions. The first thing is, um, as I said, we have a similarity matrix from the behavioral data and we have a similarity matrix based on neural data. We can use Spearman's correlations to compare how much they are correlated with each other Using permutation tests, we can also measure the significance. And we find that actually, if you just look at the whole models, the nine by nine versus the nine by nine uh, terms, there is no significant uh, as, uh, correlation between them. It's about 0.21. Um, so we wanted to dig deeper into that. And that's again, also, also starting to inform us that potentially there is a gap between how we behaviorally look at these, this construct of creativity with how much, again, the neural information is allowing us to infer about it. Um, so we wanted to move ahead and this, this analysis only looks, gives us uh, information about the whole uh, matrix, but the whole matrix. So the next thing that we did is we started looking at the correlation across uh, the rows, again, to look at the, at the correlation of, for each of these terms with the behavior and the neural um, 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 data. Okay, so we just can, we can just take for cognitive control, just the row and look at how much it correlates with at the full model. And another thing that we did is we started removing terms one at a time and computing the similarities between the, this matrix without a specific term to examine how much removing a term from this analysis improves or uh, hurts the correlations between them. So this is a leave one out sort of analysis. This is an example, remove here uh, imagine, uh, imagery, and then we conduct this comparison and we see that there's actually an interesting uh, increase in the correlation between the entire map. Okay. 
So we have three types of analysis uh, looking at these term-based matrices. One is the full model, the other is the row correlations, and the third is uh, the Lee Van Out model, which this table summarizes all of this information and there's quite a lot of information. Uh, here at the top, what we call the full models, again, is the nine by nine versus the nine by nine. This is the 0.21 correlation where we just correlate the two models one with each other and we, didn't, we don't find any significant correlation. The, each of the columns is again, comparing that row correlation. So looking just for cognitive control, it's correlation between the behavior and the neural model and it's quite significant. So it's quite a match again between the similarity of cognitive control with the other terms at the behavioral and the neural level. Um, and we can look at all of these terms and over here, down here, is what happens when we are doing the leave one out model analysis. Okay. And also for the full model, for the entire model, we can compare it this time eight by eight versus eight by eight, and each of those constructs separately, uh, or term, sorry. Um, and what we find interestingly is, is, if you see here, if we remove the term flexibility from the model, from the behavioral model and from the neural model, actually now the fit of these two models becomes significantly positive. It goes up to 0.35. And this also happens when we um, remove the term imagery, okay? The model the fit now becomes significantly positive and it's much higher. And we'll get back to that at, at the end. But this is a way to start allowing us to start asking questions about what, what, is, what, is, what is happening here and whether are we not measuring these terms well enough or uh, how are they interfering with fitting a model that better relates behavior and brain? Uh, if another thing that pops out, I hope, is that there are three sort of terms that are all, all overall very significant core fitting between the behavior and the neural models. The first is cognitive control. The second is divergent thinking, which we talked about. And the third is um, novelty. So these potentially are very strongly as stable core components of, of creativity terms. But again, this is, is very hard to make any strong inferences from, from our data, which is very minimal. Okay. So this is the big first analysis that we did looking at um, you know, term-based com comparisons of models that are based on these term similarities, either from behavior or from the neural data. But we can ask, how much are the tests? If you remember, we're building these models based on fMRI papers um, and, that, and that are using different tasks, potentially different tasks to measure each of these terms. And we can ask how much are the terms, are the tasks that are being used in these specific studies changing or affecting the, the fits of the models and the relations that we see in this table? So to ask that question, and again, to ask questions about the, 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 the validity of the specific tasks that we should use to study uh, different notions of creative thinking, we and the, the co-authors of this project, we um, identified, we selected for each of these nine terms okay, that we've been constantly talking about, uh, the three mostly widely relevant tasks that are used to measure these terms. Okay. So for example, common control, uh, Stroop, Flanker task, and the go no go task. Okay. For divergent thinking, verbal, uh, verbal generation task, or fluency task. Okay. So these are just tasks that are widely used in all of these creativity neuroscience papers. Okay. So now that we have identified, um, and also it's important, I don't know if you can see this here, but there are three of these terms um, generation and divergent thinking and novelty that we, the consensus that we arrived when we were trying to find, identify these tasks, we go to the same two types of tasks and that's gonna be important uh, in a second. But overall, what we wanted to do as a second step after looking at the term-based analysis was to, um, to start asking, can we switch can we as to build a, a meta-analytic map that is not based on the term, but is based on from the data of the task that is used to study the term. So we go through the same process with Neurosense 
and identifying papers that use these specific tasks. And we uh, uh, now use these maps that are based on the tasks and not on the terms. As a first step, we're gonna do this just for cognitive control, which you see here. What we do is we keep all of the other eight based, uh, term-based neuroanalytical maps and we build three different models of three neural, neural meta-analytical maps of cognitive control that each of them is based on one of the three different tasks that we identify that measures uh, cognitive control. So a flanker, meta-analytical map, go, no, go, and a street. And then we do, so we have now a, a, a similarity matrices that are built by eight term-based maps, neuroanalytical maps, and one task-based map. And from the behavior level, we still have the nine by nine uh, matrix. Uh, I hope that's clear. And then we do the same sort of comparisons, the full model. And we see that again, there's no significant mo uh, correlations between the full model and, the, um, and between the two types of data. When we look at the individual, uh, uh, the correlation between the individual constructs, now what we see is that when we, uh, uh, when we build a map that is based on Stroop, that has the most significant correlation between the behavior and the brain, indicating that Stroop is the most uh, uh, valid task to use to study uh, cognitive control. However, if you, if you see, if you go row below for creativity now, actually the, ta the map that is based on, on Stroop is not, uh, it's not correlating as significantly as for the two other ones. Right? So there is some trade-off, but for divergent thinking again, divergent thinking seems to be very stable strongly correlated uh, brain behavior construct. So that is one step forward into again, starting to, uh, trying to identify or to examine the contribution of specific tasks and how well they actually measure uh, the terms or the concepts that we're interested in. The next step that we wanna do is now we own, so far this slide, we're only looking at cognitive control where we're switching the term for a task. Now we want to do this for the entire nine terms that we use but as I said before, for three of those terms, they have the same task. So we drop them and we went even smaller matrices to a six by six, where we are only looking at six unique terms that have specific tasks that are different that measure them. But we wanted to make this even a little bit more complex and we have for each of the um, cognitive control, we have the three different tasks that we just looked at the slide before. And for creativity, we're looking at two different tasks. And then we're doing all these comparisons again. And we're still, and we're starting to flesh out small, dif interesting differences. And this is a very minimal analysis and we should really be careful about any possible inferences. But the idea is to show that we can use this to start to move ahead into asking qu specific questions about the mapping of the tasks that we are using to study terms and the creativity domain and how well do they actually measure them? And that is very powerful in our ability to better understand what task we should use for the, uh, for, to do research on creativity. So overall, again, I tried to keep highlighting this and I wanna highlight this even more. This is just a proof of concept, which is a very small first step in our ability to, to leverage these meta-analytic um, data and, and, and databases to look at how well um, tasks map onto terms, but it is extremely powerful in our ways to, to set a, a, a long-term um, understanding of what these tasks and terms are actually giving us in our ability to study creativity. And we are trying to, we are demonstrating how, again, using these data-driven approaches based on meta analytic maps of fMRI can inform us or can tell us something and the question is how much, what is this really telling us is, is, is still needs to be better determined and to conduct follow-up research, but it's starting to tell us something about the mapping of tasks to terms at the neural level uh, with, with the behavior. And um, I said that before about some potential interesting findings that we have is one is on the, um, what constructs or terms are actually, uh, um, potentially, what are they telling us about measuring creativity as a whole? And potentially maybe flexibility and imagery, uh, maybe we're not measuring them well enough to be able to say something that is relevant about creativity. Maybe we need to use different tasks to, to ask questions about these specific terms. Or maybe there are not a core components of creativity thinking 
And all these questions allow, uh, force us to advance our understanding and develop our theories on, on creativity. On the flip side of that, we are finding very, very stable, strongly relevant brain, brain, brain behavior relevant constructs on, that relate to terms of creativity, divergent thinking, cognitive control, and novelty, potentially highlighting the role, the, this, this, the importance of these terms. There's a lot of limitations in our study. Uh, one of them is that we are mining neuroscience that is, is doing text analysis on the whole papers, but actually the, the, the resolution in that analysis should be lowered into fMRI analysis, or that's maybe sort of technical details, but there's potentially a lot of noise that we are capturing in the way that, that, that neuroscience currently allows us to, to ask to mine it and ask questions. Um, the number of studies on creativity in neuroscience is extremely small and is definitely driving a lot of the noise and affecting the results that we have, which is why I keep saying that we should be very careful in any inferences or interpretations that we make. And even more, we only looked at, we went from 10 to nine to even six types of comparisons. That's extremely minimal. And we really have to be able to move forward we wanted to, in the, or the study, to have a very short survey where experts only have a, a short amount of time when they're doing this. But we really need to find ways to, to do this in a much larger scale and to ask questions about many other types of cognitive terms, constructs, processes that relate to uh, creativity. Um, so, but again, why do this at all? We think this is extremely exciting in, in, in moving forward into an ability to going from a data-driven approach to connect between tasks, to map the ability of tasks to map onto behavior based on this neural data, and also potentially start telling us some interesting things, even though more complicated things from a theoretical construct on, on the terms that come into play in, in creative, uh, creative thinking. So overall, what is creativity? Creativity is a multidimensional construct, and we need to move forward into better understanding and using more sophisticated uh, and computational data-driven method to study this multidimensionality to better understand the tasks that we can use to measure this and then also how these constructs or terms relate to each other. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Red, for this great uh, lecture. Um, Adina, uh, why don't you start? Okay, thank you very much. That was really interesting. I have a bunch of questions. Um, I guess the first one, just to make sure that I'm understanding uh, what was going on in the, in the slides where you showed the behavioral versus the neural data, it looked like there was no cross correlation between any of the constructs except for divergent thinking. Uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, creativity, is that right? Yeah, and this is, uh, this is highlighting the problem because divergent thinking is the most widely used. There's an over bias in the very minimal amount of studies that we have, that, that some inflation here about the relation. Yeah, sorry, you will go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess I'm puzzled because I would think that if you're doing uh, similarities of activation patterns in you know, these different tasks that you would find correlations between many of these tasks because they probably share different kinds of components. And so I guess I find it, I, I find it surprising. And then also, I would have thought that the lesson to take home is that maybe divergent thinking and creativity are not two distinct constructs. Um, but then it seemed like later in the talk, you were focusing on those as some of the most important constructs. Great. It's a great question. So a couple of things. One, we're not using patterns here. We're creating, again, activation maps and then correlating how similar they are to each other. So I would be careful. I would be more careful in, in, in that. But um, what we can't so find. Yeah, yeah, thresholded ahead. data there? Sorry? Sorry, can you say that again? Are, are you using thresholded data? I mean, when I look at this, I see very little activation anywhere where you know you would expect there to be activation throughout the brain. Yes, yes we're doing we're doing FDR Z threshold and correction. 
Um, I see. And, okay, and, that, and, that, yeah. that makes and also, sense. Yes, exactly. So, and, and again, I want to say that there's very few papers that we, that we are using here. And all of this is really weakening all of this and, and, and it is important to keep that in mind about any inferences. The only thing that we find about divergent thinking is that it is extremely significantly correlated between the brain and the behavior. But what is that really telling us is, is we should be very careful in how we talk about this um, because of all of these caveats. Okay, I have other questions, but I think I'll wait until the end and see if, um, you know, if there's time. Yeah, so let me just remind you that if you have a question, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and just write your name so that I can promote you to the status of a panelist. Um, since no one has volunteered a question now, let me just ask you, uh, you had a, a somewhat naive question, um, but I'm, I'm curious to know exactly how it bears on the whole project and then Adina can come back. So, and, and I think the slide you're showing us here is just the one that, that prompted the question. So you have this correlation R equal to a 0.21, R equal to a 0.38. Now, and, and you said the R equal to 0.21 is not very high, it's not significant. Well, um, not significant. Now, my obvious, let me finish, my, my obvious reaction is, well, I mean, if you take into account measurement error uh, of at least some of these constructs, then you should not expect a very high correlation because, you know, the measurement error is going to be bonding, it's going to give you an upper bond to the size of the correlation. So 0.21 really might actually be quite a high correlation as soon as you take into account measurement error. And, uh, you know, you, you do also permutation test and my memory is a little bit vague, but that permutation test are very low power for finding significance. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, really, another way of asking my question is what's a benchmark? What would be a high correlation? What would be a low correlation given that measurement error is, an, is unknown and given maybe the low power of the test you're using? So I think what's important is to say is significant correlation versus a non-significant correlation. Um, and we're using the permutation test to measure that. Whether these are high or low, we don't have any benchmarks and we don't have really have any expectations. But the permutation said is that, that potentially, I actually think it has enough power, but just again, to remind, we're doing this on nine by nine correlations. There's, this is a very small sample. So there is potentially a lot of measurement error here for sure. And all we want to argue for is that we can use this approach to start moving forward. And we, if we could go large scale on this, then maybe we can have more stable um, inferences where we better control for all of these uh, measurement noises. In fact, that there is a 0.21 correlation. Overall, it could be surprising the sense that there is such a relation. Um, but the fact that when we remove some of these terms, we do it get to significant correlations at the whole uh, model level, and is is sort of this is maybe more of an interesting uh, finding. And what are what terms are right. lowering or increasing the, the correlation right. and what does that mean? What does that tell right. us? Right. We're Is not that, there yet at all. We're not there at all. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's helpful. So the right focus is not so much the low correlation or the significant, it's just the change as soon as you remove one. Cool. Exactly, exactly. That, that's helpful, thanks. I did, I did, I did, no one has wrong. Ah, oh, yes, so there is a question. Um, uh, Joe, I will promote you. Give me a sec. All right. Joe will ask a question and then Adina. <laughs> Joe, your turn. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I actually had a quick question more about how you're thinking about creativity and how your results might bear on it. And the question in quick form is, you know, some some think some scientists think about creativity as a trait and are interested in the difference between individuals who are particularly creative or divergent over others. But others have been interested in particular domains and creativity as a skill that's exercised at a particular time. So uh, in uh, neuroimaging of music, people are interested in the difference between uh, people who are, you know, playing from sheet music versus improvisation and what the brain differences 
of things like, you know, going into a creative or improv mode would be. And so I guess I was curious in your thinking about this project, do you think you're tra tapping into creativity as some kind of trait that individuals have or as some kind of um, skill that we all exercise when we're exercising it or, or both? And I'm just curious what you, what you think about that question. Well, that, that's a great question. And overall domain specific versus domain general creativity is a big open question. But at the brain level, research and musicians versus artists versus students, there's, there's constantly a lot of overlap. I personally look at this as from a trait level perspective and the, the terms that we're using are very general. Um, but we are going about this asking specific experts that are biased and how they're thinking about this. But, but overall, I would say, you know, specifically for me, so just speaking for myself, yeah, looking at this from a trait level, focusing at the core cognitive capacities um, that facilitate creative thinking. Some have termed this, some have termed creativity as an orchestra of cognitive processes that when they're playing together in a specific unique way, that what brings forth the emergent aspect of that is creative thinking. So yes, I think research, a lot of people, well, some people that I know in creative research would say, yeah, creativity is about multiple di complex parallel dynamics of different cognitive processes that facilitate that. And that changes across tasks, context, domains, uh, individual differences. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, Adina, do you want to, um, to uh, sure. have a Yeah, so um, I, I guess I'm a little puzzled by, um, so you were talking about the, the degree to which cognitive control, for instance, correlates with Stroop task, and that it looks like most people are using Stroop to measure this. And, you know, a task is quite different than a capacity or, or a function. And I'm wondering whether the fact that we're tr we're trying to get at at this capacity with a single tool is actually um, taking us further away from understanding what cognitive control is rather than closer. Because you know you could argue what's happening there isn't just cognitive control; it's all kinds of things associated with a, a Stroop task. And and what we might be interested in is the things that are common to all the tasks that we think of as cognitive control. And so that um, narrowing down the task base might be exactly the wrong way to try to get at an ontology. I think that's a great question. And, and I wanna again say an important disclaimer here that all of this is based on a very subset of data that was extracted for under terms that relate to creativity. So this is not about the cognitive control space. This is actually about within the space of neural findings on creativity, how well is the task Stroop measuring the concept of cognitive control as assessed by creativity researchers? So there's a lot of very so specific overfitting here that again, have, yeah, really have to be careful. But then the flip side of that, I think these are two specific different questions because what we wanna do because of the challenges in creativity research is to improve our understanding of what tasks to use. And then there we do want to find a specific task that can really give us the most money for our buck. Uh, and that's why we are trying to identify, the, examine the differences that are caused by specific tasks. But I don't think it tells us anything general about cognitive control. I wanna be very careful about that. Just saying that again, with this specific subset of data that we are looking at, what we find is again from one thing that Stroop matches on the best to this behavioral assessment of behavioral ratings of cognitive control and how they relate to other creativity constructs. But again, the, the creativity construct doesn't map on right. with that model that well. So again, there's a lot of trade offs, and again, this goes back to how much careful we need to be interpreting anything that comes out at this point, but just, just as a way to show a proof of construct, uh, concept for this approach. Great. 
for really All interesting. Right. So, so we, uh, we need to uh, stop here for uh, today. I'd like to uh, thank our two speakers, Marco and Yoed, for their uh, lectures. And um, uh, we hope to see uh, all of you in uh, two weeks from now on Thursday, uh, December 3rd at 10 a.m. for uh, Joe McAfee's talk. Great. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. 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 See you soon.